At this point in the Masterclass series, we would like to go a little bit off script, or quite a lot off script, to be honest. We'll be looking at trigger conversion. This is a subject that is not covered in the uh, PDF files. And um, the uh, motivation for doing so could be the following. And to just recap, we have created this setup you see here. And if we simulate it, we click on this button, then we are cycling through some menu options. One of them is VMix. When we get to VMix, then we have this channel four, uh, or channel variable that we can cycle on this button. Again, we are just playing with imagination here. We are building up something where a menu variable can give us three different like pages of stuff happening up here in this section. And then when we are on VMix, we imagine that there will be additional things that we want to change on the button just next to. So this is why we have added that in this case. Previous video showed you how to enable the view of this in the case VMix is selected. So all those details are already covered. What I would like to do is to uh, imagine an alternative way of handling channel. What if one of these encoders that are now uh, available when vmix is selected, that would be this layer over here called vmix stuff. Let's say encoder number D, this guy. If that encoder was actually, I just selected it here. What if that would change the channel instead of this button. So we don't need that button, but we rather want to do the same. Now, from pre previous videos, we know that we have created a master behavior called navigation. And if we associate that with the variable channel like that, then we should, and we say no here because we want to use our own step. Well, we can also try step change. Actually, step change is one we are going to come back to because if you choose step change, you see that, mm, yeah, okay, it seems like now we can do that. And can we? Yes, we can. Step change. That is a beauty of separating parameters and behaviors that you can take any parameter and combine with any behavior and then slap them onto a button, knob, encoder, fader, joystick, whatever. And there'll be some functionality coming out of it. Now, step change is one of our standard behaviors, master behaviors, that you can build on top of. And that will work with joystick faders, anything, actually. Hey, why don't we try it? I mean, here we have a joystick. Let's get back into configuration mode. Let's just imagine we, we click here, we add a behavior, we pick um, step change. No, wait, no, 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 no. We will just take the variable. Oh, sorry. I think I got it created on a wrong layer, did I not? Um, am I doing this the wrong place? Oh, yeah, yeah, I have it down here and rotate. Now, that gives me a chance to just briefly talk about the layer tree. If you do not observe where you are when you, in this case, click rotation of the joystick, the behavior you are defining might get onto a wrong layer. I think this is the wrong layer because being down here with the rotate behavior will not have access to my variables or my uh, navigation master behavior if I wanted so, because they are defined on this layer and is only seen by any layer under that. So this is wrong. This is why I would now cut and paste it in up here. Now, that changes the game because now when I go here, pick a variable, I have my channel variable available. And I can confirm that it's user step change. Hey, so actually now if we go into this mode, then you can see if I am rotating the joystick, I actually get some response on how to change this variable value. And that's one of the power, 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 powerful things about these behaviors. We'll look more at that in this episode of the training series. And um, but but I just this, this was a huge detour. Let's focus on the encoder here because what I really wanted on the encoder was to change this into navigation. That is the master behavior we have de designed and we have spent some time understanding how that works. So we would love to use that. This is what we'll be doing in, in, in this video. The thing is, as soon as I try to simulate this, nothing is going to happen. Why? It worked down here, right? And I can use the edges to go the you know up and I can cycle down and I can rotate. Why nothing happened on encoder? Well, that's what I'm here to tell you because we did not create a event handler for encoders. So if I click this, no, no, no. If we go and watch 
the structure of our master behavior, we can just as well go edit that directly. If we go and do that, we notice that event handler for left button presses is there. There's one for right button presses. There's one here for cycling. And then we could create one for pulsed devices, call it whatever we want, then go up here, add a handler type pulsed and so on. But what I wanted to show you now is that it is actually possible also inside a an event handler like this one where after all we have spent some time on setting up the set mode and the IO reference all and so on. We can actually convert triggers into button presses. And that's what I want to show you because that's pretty powerful. Well, you could build up everything by having separate event handlers for different devices, but you could also convert your triggers. So let's look at what we have. This is the event handler for pressing the left side of the four-way button, right? What you can do down here in event preprocessors is to say, what if I have a pulsed component sending me pulses instead of button presses on the left edge? So I can say, if that comes to me with a negative polarity, now you need to know that if you turn counterclockwise, you get minus one as a pulse. That's what we call a negative polarity. So with negative polarity inputs from an encoder, I want this converted into a binary output, act down and left edge, submit. And then let's try this. Now, if I go in the left direction counterclockwise, you see that the value just counted down. So it worked. Let's just try it up all the way. And then I go right, nothing happens. You can't increase the value more. But as I'm going left, it's turning the value down. So what I just did was to create a, an event preprocessor that converts incoming pulses to button presses. All I need to do now is to do the same for the right one down here. So there we would say from pulsed. So now you, you have a chance to see it all done once again. If they are positive edge pulses, I want the output trigger to be act down the edge should be right. Submit. Let's try it. Yes. So now it works. We have now created a master behavior. Or we have extended the master behavior to support four-way buttons and also encoders. We have not supported analog components and joysticks with this one, but those two. And you have had a chance now to learn what a event preprocess is. So what I want to do is to kind of just um, yeah, I want to actually show you this in JSON. Sorry about that. But guys, we need to get there at some point inside the JSON editor. And if you format this code, you can see this is the code that is driving our behavior, our master behavior. And the things that I just added to our left and our right event handlers is right here. This is the code. This is the event preprocessor from pulses to binary uh, triggers. Input polarity negative should give an act down output event and a left edge one of those. And then you can scroll down here and you can see the same right here. Actually, if you just spend a moment to look at this JSON code, you'll see that all the things from the UI are right there. You just wouldn't have no clue how to put them there. I can tell you one thing. If you edit this, you hold down control, press space, you get a very nice little helper that will give you all the features. But hey, you still need to know what pulse core step is. Those properties of these JSON objects needs to be known and mastered by you somehow. So I'm not saying that this is just straightforward and easy, um, but I think there is actually some help to be gained here. Binary sequence did not help a whole lot. I think if we had such as binary edge filter, there's, let's just remove this and then see what happens. So I put in binary edge filter if it will allow me some value options. Yes, actually it does. Every time I'm doing this, I'm just holding down control and pressing space and you'll see some values being presented to you. So that would be right. And we are good to go with that one. I want to show you how the step change behavior looks. So um, to, to do so, I um, yeah, we could just uh, set this one up maybe instead. And um, in, in addition to it really doesn't matter. But we'll just, uh, yeah, like last time, let's just check first. OK, this is the behavior that I'm changing right now. All right, all right. So that's nice. Variable uh, channel, submit, and step changes right here. Now, um, we're just using step change. Look at when I format this. This is how simple the JSON code for combining a, an IO reference like the variable channel is to combine it with a master behavior. 
it's so simple. So that's that's really nice. And then all the overrides would come down here if, if it was. But to look at what is inside step change, we press this one, show master uh, parent behavior. And the parent behavior is this one. So this is step change for you. Now let's look at what is inside step change, that master behavior designed by Skahoy. And that's a lot. This is, by the way, the most used master behavior at all that we have. First of all, we are only active if the IO reference you present us exists. So otherwise, we will blank out. That's what this one says. We have a name, we have a description. There is an IO reference, which is blank. Yes, of course it is. Just like we changed our master behavior to be blank in the IO reference because we want it to be agnostic to what parameter you, you throw at it. So this is why typically most master behaviors would be uh, blank on the IO reference. Then we have a bunch of event handlers. And it turns out that there's one called analog. That is what uh, will manage incoming analog um, position values from a fader. And apparently, this is all it takes to make it work with parameters. Just specify this. Um, these are empty, as you can see, there's a description. So OK, analog was super easily managed. Then we have an event handler called Pulsed. And um, this one will accept Pulse triggers. It has a ton of event preprocessors, actually. Let's just look at that. You see, Pulsed is really this simple. Uh, by the way, Pulsed, we have not been looking at it, but this would take in pulses plus and minus. For that, you have uh, you will specify a condition like roll over whether you want the um, it to rotate like we have done on the lower edge on the buttons that would rotate the variables indefinitely and when we press the edges it would hit the edge. I suggest that for for most for most values you want to adjust in an encoder you really like it to hit the edge at the end. That's uh, that kind of gives you you rotate and then you can't rotate anymore you don't get any further and that is a pretty nice indication that you reach the end of the range. Otherwise, it just like keep going and going and you need to scratch your head and figure out if you are uh, beyond of, you know, how many values were there actually. And, and that's not very nice. So this is why we designed it this way. Now, uh, there's the fine course uh, IO reference here, but it was the event preprocessors that we wanted to look at. If a binary input is coming, we are looking at the input edge. So this is actually reversing. The, what we just did for our own was we designed a behavior that would detect the edges. You press left edge, we do this. We press right edge, you do that. Oh, now we receive a, a negative pulse. We make a left edge, convert it to left edge. Now we receive a positive pulse. We convert that to a right edge. This is different. Here we, we natively support pulse triggers. And then we basically say, if we have a binary input coming, what to do with it? Well, if it's the bottom edge, we are going to give you a positive pulse. If it is a left edge, so that would be like turning right, increasing value. If it's a left edge, we give you a negative pulse. If it is no edge, like a NKK button, we give you a positive pulse. So that will bump the value up. If it's the right edge, we give you a positive pulse as well. OK, so if you have any buttons, bottom, no edge, right, all positive pulses left would give you a negative pulse. All right. So that would actually make four-way buttons work just like we have designed, but in a sense opposite. Then we have the speed components. Yeah, we have also input polarity. What happens if you move the joystick in negative direction? Then this code, I can quickly explain you what it does. It will divide the range from zero to 500, which is full swing on a joystick in the raw panel universe. It will divide it into three sections. 166 is one third of 500. And that means as you move the joystick all the way to the end, it would trigger, it would create three negative pulses, like one third to the, to the left, get the first pulse. Two thirds to the left, you get the second pulse. And then full swing, you get the third one. And then you need to move it all the way back to the middle, and then you can do it again. So it's like a pumping action. In other words, this 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 interpretation of a joystick would give you like three pulses, three pulses, three pulses, and then you do it the other way, three pulses, three pulses, etc. There are other ways you could do it. You could also have have it like uh, make a train of pulses, but that's not right here, not for today. Um, <clears throat> I just want to mention that the whole rollover condition is related to this one up here because. A rollover condition, as I just said, that is that that determines whether you want the value to cycle indefinitely. And 
you will have the value cycling indefinitely. If it turns out that your event was a bottom edge event or if it was a no edge event. And what that means is if you press an NKK button repeatedly or the bottom of your four way button, it's just going to cycle the value. But left and right edge will always hit the end because the rollover condition was uh, dependent on what edge of the button you were pressing. Then we have additional event handlers like reset. Reset is um, uh, it's actually a binary, uh, accepting binary inputs. And here I'm even using a binary to binary conversion. And that is because the way we can create delays like press and hold to do something is by using binary to bar binary conversions. And it has some configuration here, which is more than I can cover in this video. But this is how we reset the uh, the values to their defaults and the default is uh, set here by the binary set values which has a reference with a modifier called default to the io reference of the behavior and then there's some feedback and stuff won't cover that so guys i th i hope this was uh, an interesting and and probably a little bit um a tough um introduction to this but some of you will be thankful and excited about seeing JSON being used under the hood here. And uh, some of you may also be like, <clears throat> I hope you're going to make some more UI for me, including those small drop downs where I can just pick the value instead of having to remember the value of the variable and so on. Yes, I agree. Everything in due time. We are working on this all the time. And we're just so super excited about having this foundation on, the, on it all. So I, what I want to, to have you excited about is the potential. And there's so much you can use already. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.